Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon for those around the table here in this room for being here, and also those that are watching us on their comfortable seats at their various locations. Welcome to the Urban Transportation Seminar Series, and uh, we have an exciting presentation this afternoon. And the title of the presentation is Geo-Referencing Infrastructure Data Using the Euclid Platform. And this presentation is somewhat I'm very happy to introduce the speakers because they are from my alma mater, the good engineering school in Chicago, the other good engineering school in Chicago, IIT, the Institute of Technology, Rong Chen, uh, Rong Chen uh, who's the PE, uh, who's a PE and the president of Ugrid and Dynasty Group. Zhang uh, got his degree from IIT back in the late 80s. He preceded me in IIT by a couple of years, I'm assuming. And he started Dynasty in the mid 90s, and um, here he is to talk to us about the wonderful things they're doing through the Ubrid platform with respect to geo fencing. And um, to accompany him, we have Matt Gibbs, another IITN from the Architectural Engineering Program. And Matt, with the Chicago Transit Authority, got his degree in Bachelor's Architectural Engineering from IIT in 2008, 2007, has been with uh, CTA since 2008, and he is working for their Infrastructure Engineering Department at CTA. And so, between the two of them, they're going to tackle this really interesting presentation, and we're not going to stand in the way of who I am. And I'm going to take a seat, hand it over to John, sure. and look forward to a very exciting presentation. Well, I put my speaker off, and uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction, and also thank Ed to uh, arrange this, and also thank my co-presenter Matt here, and uh, to, to join us. Uh, uh, the topic today is uh, uh, about the, the ever-growing infrastructure big data, and uh, I'm sure everybody will agree with me, and uh, we have been dealing with more and more data. Uh, before I dive into the presentation, um, let me give you a little background uh, about how we start creating the Ugrid platform. Um, I started an engineering company called the Dynasty Group in 1994. I've been in operation for 22 years, actually, to the date, <laughs> and, uh, 22 years. And uh, uh, we might be serving, you know, uh, serving in uh, the transportation area, working on uh, you know, serving at the civil engineering area. The idea started about uh, after 10 years we get into business. Uh, and uh, the problem is, uh, we, we, you know, after 10 years, uh, uh, with uh, almost 100 jobs per year. I'm sorry? Yeah, audio too. Oh, you don't have audio? Can you hear us? system to keep track of all of that 
And it's a somewhat like a GIS system, but not quite the same. So that was the, the ambition then. And um, so about five years ago, with uh, things like the Google Map API and the other interactive map APIs that started surfacing and getting more and popular, and we, we couldn't sit still, we started developing something. And some of the ideas were actually published uh, uh, over um, the point. I have a series of articles there, and it were between two years to two, about four years ago, and uh, published over there. And uh, we won't go into any you know, real details to that. And to the latest the article on ENR, talking about some of the functions uh, of new data. Um, uh, in the uh, conference room here, uh, we have uh, the, the printout of the article, but uh, you can definitely get that online. And uh, with that, and uh, some of the ideas uh, about the platform, we're talking about the data, we're talking about infrastructure data. And uh, you know, let's uh, just take a moment to look at the life cycle of infrastructure data. Uh, typically, uh, through the process, starting with the, the planning process, then we get into engineering design, also called the CE, then we get into building or construction phase, then it's turned into the owner and operators to use the infrastructure. The lower half of this circle is pretty much a organization-based uh, operation. And they need the planning, your infrastructure, prioritize your funding, everything, and look at the, at the organization level. The upper half of the circle uh, is very much a project-based operation. Start with the lighter part of the planning, definitely to design, to construction, is a very, very project-oriented. And uh, with such, it's actually that you know, it's a nice platform, but it creates some difficulty to have the data flow, particularly from the uh, project uh, to the organization. And uh, not all of the project data uh, captured uh, during the planning, design, and construction phase get into the organization. And here are a few reasons. And uh, the project dependent uh, methodology, each project uh, for the, its own goal and purpose gets its own uh, uh, methodology. And uh, between the serving, uh, NDT, traffic, uh, you know, it's a complex. Uh, these plans in there, and then there are so many different uh, ways to collect data and generate data. So that's also creates some difficulty to get in the data, to track the data. And uh, also the direct check of technology. You know, today's technology to do serving or non-destruct testing, for example, is definitely different from uh, uh, what we've been using 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And uh, the need also to preserve uh, the raw data and with this metadata also creating some difficulties. Let's take a look at uh, the current technology, especially with some of its uh, limitations. One of the very common thing almost that every uh, office has is a file server. And you create a drive, or we have a drive attached to each computer, we call it the P drive or project. And uh, if you look at the hierarchy in the file server, we usually create the folders by project number, funding number, or certain uh, uh, method, but a very little, almost zero metadata get into there. So it's almost impossible to search data based on its uh, metadata, such as location or other uh, characteristics. And uh, of course, everybody gets a uh, firewall in their intranet, so it offers a very limited accessibility to most of the stakeholders uh, in the transportation area. And uh, typically, you need uh, expensive software. You know, for instance, the CAD and uh, or other software dealing with uh, something, for instance, like uh, uh, LiDAR data, and uh, to 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 be you to work on the the data. GIS is great, but uh, GIS also has its own limitations. Typically, with the GIS, you need a dedicated group of staff with a uh, uh, you know training uh, in order to process the data to. to host the data on the platform. And also, uh, GIS is uh, limited to uh, the spatial data types such as a point, line, polygons, or pixels. And um, being an information system, and it's already predefined, so a lot of the data needs to be digitized or extracted from its source so that it is come into an information system you know, for such a tracking, which also uh, the, the, the 
in all data actually get a somewhat lost in that process. So it can lack of the ability to, to share their all data. So those create a number of difficulties to address the uh, most current need of the data. And uh, one thing we came up with is uh, uh, based on the concept of uh, everything is somewhere, especially in the infrastructure business. And you build a bridge, the, the, the bridge has to be built somewhere. So since we're talking about uh, connecting people and the data, and uh, luckily in our business, every time we collect or generate data, we usually start with uh, some kind of a referencing system. The referencing system can be XY coordinates, and uh, in a global way, can be latitude and longitude with a WGS84 being a standard now globally. If you look at the building or facility, column lines, which is really a referencing system, you know, people design that and the referencing of the column line A1, C3, so far and so on. If you look at land surveyor, being a land surveyor, I'm very familiar with this system called the PLSS, Public Land Surveying System. And we create a section, township, range to referencing the land. As a matter of fact, uh, I had uh, from history, by learning land surveying, I learned that, you know, each township had a school section. You know, everybody grew up in this country. You know, frankly, I was amazed at how important education was you know, back then, even. And with this as a, a black hole concept, we call u a user to reference infrastructure data depository. So the ambition here is to create a depository to help to keep track and uh, share infrastructure data. Uh, with this as a concept, uh, and uh, we started developing first, uh, and we focused on the infrastructure disciplines, the bridge, highway, you know, railroad, transit, so on and so on. And understanding the nature of a business, there's a project need, there's an organizational need. As I said earlier, usually the data from the project created or collected does not flow into the organizational level very smooth. So what we did is at the project level, and if all the data can be published over maps and georeferencing, and then we can first share the data to the project group. Let's solve an immediate problem, you know, enable pretty much all of the stakeholders to be able to access and maybe view the data. So we call that solution project data sharing. And uh, while the project is being shared through a web portal or through a web-based uh, tool, and uh, for each piece of data, a thread can be put into a cloud data management system. It's just a handler of the data which we can query, we can, you know, we can search so that the data can be off as we need it. <coughs> On the organizational side, we build tools, or several tools to interface with the organization of existing data. Then with the data through the project that being handled in the cloud database, one of the very powerful tools we build that we call you find is uh, searching the data based on geolocation. And uh, with the two solutions combined, we are hoping and you really can help to easily and eff effectively to show, share, host, and find infrastructure data. So that's really the, the concept. And then we further broken down the solutions uh, and uh, to two areas. And uh, uh, which enables both non technical and the technical user to access the data. On the project data sharing side, one of the emphasis we have is everyone can publish through the web based uh, tools. Uh, everyone, every engineer, every planner can take <coughs> his or her data, go through the uh, process, and then the goal is if you search on the internet, or if you buy things from Amazon, you're able to publish your data. And with that, then each of these web portal is a map with your own data superimposed on that. And uh, a URL can be shared uh, with the project team. We call that a project data web page. Uh, knowing each project can have many of these data web pages. We develop another tool to organize all of the project data web pages uh, uh, through a tool uh, we call you can, 
uh, with some advanced navigation features, which we'll uh, demo uh, in a minute. On the cloud side, uh, as I mentioned, the searching data based on location of interest uh, is uh, definitely one of the key features in there. Because by searching data based on location, you can quickly filter down the a few data set nearby you so that uh, you can make a quick determination and which data is useful for your next project. And uh, uh, for the existing data uh, you share is to disseminate uh, your data uh, into the cloud with a control environment. So with all of that, uh, let me go through uh, a few quick demos. And uh, first of all, the cloud data management solution with the UFund you share. And by clicking on this, uh, now I'm entering the front page of UGRID simply by typing www.ugrid.com. This is what you're going to see. And uh, assuming we have a project which is uh, for simplification uh, at uh, our zip code 60606. And uh, we're using the Google API, so literally anything Google can search on their map, we can do the same thing. And uh, so by putting 60606 on there, I gave you the central point of that zip code. And uh, assuming we have a job there. And uh, so I call that my location of interest. As soon as I set this as my LOI, a series of layers shows up on the side here. And these layers are dynamically programmed on there based on the LOI. In other words, if you are in Chicago, in downtown, most likely you don't care the data in San Francisco. And uh, by having this, uh, what we call public layers, so, so uh, you feel has uh, going through a series of uh, searching or continue on that effort, uh, whatever the available data. A good example, for instance, is bridges. So by clicking on bridges, there are over a thousand bridges uh, within 10 miles uh, from that LOI point I just set. And uh, keep in mind that, that a thousand data points that was just pulled off, this is live on the internet from uh, over 700,000 records. By reducing <coughs> this to a mile, we can quickly reduce that down to about 176 bridges. <laughs> and then we can further reduce this down to like a thousand point that we can see as a handful of bridges. So this is the concept of if you have a project, we can search data because we're having fun searching data. We search data because we have a project, we have an effort on our mind. And usually that project has a location, without a doubt. And by searching data around that location, you can quickly filter down the data available to you so that you can make a quick determination of which one is what you're looking for. And so the bridges has the georeferencing you know, as a single position. Uh, which are fairly easy to, to incorporate into the value share process uh, into the database. How about something existing record? And uh, the PDF joints, for instance, in the city of Chicago, we have something called the 80 acre sheet. It's actually the street atlas. Anybody who does land survey work, I'm sure you have used it to that. And uh, such a map, and uh, traditionally it's on paper or whatever, and in more recent years it has been scanned into PDF. And uh, you know, as a young land surveyor in my earlier career, I used to go to City Hall, spend four hours to buy a page, you know, to do my work. Now the city has offered them all on the website. It was one problem; it's hard to find. And so what we did is, if I click on a layer, what we call mediator sheet. Well, within a thousand feet, there not within five miles, there are about three hundred seventy-eight of them. And how do we do this? Knowing that each 80 acre sheet is a half of a quarter section. Because we have the PLS system, the sectional, uh, sectional you know, uh, land system, and uh, the land is further divided into quarter sections, and 80 acre sheet is the exact half of that quarter of section. So we know the position. If we have the underlying infrastructure, you know, the, in other words, the reference, of the sections, these are all of the sections, it's all georeferenced. The UBIT has to go through the process of georeference all of the sections nationwide. By doing that, we can somewhat fairly accurately calculate the central point of the 80 acre, which is the half of a quarter section. So by assigning that to holding the letter line, in other words, to that particular PDF file, store them into a database, we can accomplish such a search. And usually, 
a, even a sensible land surveying job will probably would only cover you know, half a mile to a mile. So these are the few sheets available within half a mile that if I click on any one of them, it actually tells me this is the west half of the southeast quarter of section 9 of somewhere. And uh, by clicking on this uh, viewer, this is our PDF viewer. We're actually live pulling this 80 acre sheet from the CDGS portal. And so it's become a very powerful tool to search based on location and uh, you can find the data you're looking for. Uh, with this kind of a mechanism, virtually any data, as long as you know where the data is at, you can put the geotag on there, through that into a database. It doesn't even matter what the real data is. And uh, as far as the viewability, if the data is uh, 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 browser friendly, we can show them out here. If it's not, usually through PDF, snapshots, we can take a kind of a snapshot of the data. That is a matter of if you can further download the data and then do whatever you need to do with it. So these two cases basically demonstrated the, the cloud data management in the solution you could provide. And uh, through you find, we can quickly find the data. And uh, something we're working on is uh, uh, continue to uh, dig a little bit deeper, potential uh, Potential development, of, for instance, solutions for AE companies, architectural engineering firms, to handle this data. Contractors may have a different need. Uh, potential solutions for transportation planning, uh, for research work, literally anything. As long as we're dealing with the data with location, it can be managed this way, stored and defined this way. Uh, moving on to uh, project data sharing, and uh, I'll quickly go through uh, a few examples and uh, uh, on a, what do we call it, a sample data portal. First of all, this is actually uh, the Grand Central Terminal in New York. Uh, CAD files. We're, de we're developing a lot of CAD files, but again, as I said earlier, if I store them into a file server, it's difficult to access them. It has a very limited accessibility. By putting those layers into an XML, most of the CAD software now offers that. Uh, Microsoft are all the cast. And now we have a tool called the KML to Mac. And so the background information here is really a KML file generated from a CAD joint that we can superimpose them over Mac. And by having some of the grid system on like an E31, we can allow the map quickly fly to a certain function. Imagine different disciplines have a different need in accessing data. And I'll demonstrate this more you know, with the CPA example. Uh, engineering plans, whether it's the PDF or uh, scan PDF. And um, we can, by knowing at least the two points on the map is geoposition, and then we can superimpose them on the map. And here's just another example of that. And um, we got to collect the a lot of video information. Especially more recently, working with the CTA, Matt and this group, we started using GoPro to uh, collect the data. The hard part of video and uh, photo is, uh, you know, once you get the data collected, uh, how do you find the position where you want to look at? A video can be a couple of hours. Uh, you know, you can have uh, literally thousands of uh, uh, images. And so what we did is while we're collecting video, we actually put the GPS receiver on the train. And then create the interface uh, by linking the video time and the GS position. So we can allow the view experience uh, and also a camera on the map so you know where you're at. And uh, by fast forward the video, the map will jump to that location. So kind like the faster of the internet feed, right? the, the, the quicker. And, uh, Dragging the camera up and down along this alignment, and the video will jump into position. Since we're using a GoPro, which is a 4K video, we can afford to divide it into any quadrant, and it doesn't have to be four. And then, if we need to look at a particular asset, we can quickly jump to that, for instance, look at a hot rail or something. So, and we can do this on the fly. 
per credere che le vada a mettere questo aperto per vedere. Uh, photos. And uh, notice that I got about 53 photos in this album as I per vacation from about two years ago uh, in Europe. And the solution is uh, most of the cameras these days have a GPS. Not only that, it actually has a compass to show its orientation. We even went one step further. If you're <coughs> really using the zoom level, the view angle is actually programmed in there. It will show the different zoom angle. So by just to simply click on the different snapshot, you can see from where the photo was taken and also to which direction. And because of the hardest part of taking photo is you can easily take a few thousand photos in a couple of days. But when you come back to the office to index them, uh, where I took that, uh, which direction I'm looking at, that's usually a very time consuming and labor intensive uh, effort. So by doing this, and I will build all that. Of course, we keep uh, all of the EXIF data you know, captured uh, in the JPEG file in there. Uh, another function. And uh, this is actually came from one of our construction managers. And he said, on the construction job, we set up some fixed position. Every week, I go back there and take a photo of the document on the construction site. Imagine a job takes two years, 20 locations, and you can get photos in there. And uh, so now, uh, why? Uh, he said, you know, the, the construction manager told me, and uh, usually when I was looking for a photo, uh, the clue I get is I know approximately one and two photos, such as the month. So I said, okay, that's a good tip to us. So we're working with our developers. We can box the time frame. And of course, we can play around the calendars there as well. That simply did apply. Now from a 53 photo album. So by simply doing that, so we're able to reduce uh, you know, the set from uh, several thousand to maybe just a handful of photos uh, and then very effectively looking for the photo that we're looking for. Uh, we have some other features here. For instance, you can generate a report. I won't go through the details. Uh, and we have some samples on our web portal, so feel free to play with it. Um, CAD models, 3D. And uh, this is another thing uh, very interesting. And by having the geolocation, typically, if you give a average user a three-dimensional CAD model, it's very difficult for that user. It requires the three-dimensional way of thinking, the training, the software, so on and so on. So one of our solutions is uh, uh, by offering the vantage point, the view point uh, which you would like your user to look at your model, then you can cer certainly communicate that. So we build a viewer, which is a panoramic viewer. We can host uh, any panoramic photo. And uh, so from the CAD models uh, or BIM models, uh, we can create the snapshots, uh, then build a panoramic viewer. And by georeferencing the location of where the Video point, in other words, the one video point in our app, we can effectively communicate or share the data. Again, there are probably more sample about more uh, sample about the, the LiDAR data, you know, which is a uh, 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 example. Uh, aerial maps, I demonstrated the PDF files, so we can superimpose, of course, if there's aerial photos, we can definitely superimpose that on the map. And here, and uh, with the Google Map at the background, you can see the aerial image. If I turn on the satellite, you can hardly see that. So it's, you know, with the accurate georeferencing, you can line up, you know, really good. Uh, next, I'll turn to, uh, I'll turn to Matt Gibbs uh, and uh, start talking about some of the CPA experience that you know, we have. So we just wanted to review a little bit about the um, history of LiDAR and CTA. So a little bit about our system, first of all. <coughs> 224 miles of track with 146 stations, and so that's a pretty infrastructure-intensive organization. We also have a lot of other facilities um, to support this. So, um, so we started out with doing LiDAR. And okay. so we started out doing LiDAR on the uh, red line on the south, and we had
had fresh fruit of LIDAR set up every few hundred feet, and that is very labor intensive to, um, to accomplish. So we got very high quality data, but you guys were out for months, but maybe <laughs> collecting LIDAR data. And um, so we were looking for a more efficient way to do it. So then we came up with a, uh, a mobile scanner idea with one um, of these guys. And they basically built a uh, frame to put on the front of the train car. And we had two scanners mounted on the rail car with a GPS receiver and an inertial measurement unit. And so this one here is our pilot model. And we've also run two others since then with uh, additional scanners. So with this, what we could do in months, now we can do it in a few hours. And, um, and so it saves a dramatic amount of time to, uh, to collect the LiDAR data. So now we have the LiDAR data, and what do you do with the LiDAR data? Now I kind of post the LiDAR data in our office, and I can stick it on a server and nobody's going to ever find it again. But that's kind of a waste of of good data, and same with the video that we collect with the LiDAR. So, because um, we also put a video camera on the LiDAR. <clears throat> so that just sits on the server. Well now, with Ugrid, we can actually use the data in a much more user-friendly way, and we can share that with all of the people involved with the project. So in this case, with the Dan Ryan Expressway project, um, the designer was able to get the LiDAR, and this is one of the uh, terrestrial scans in the tunnel by uh, IIT. So, um, so the designer was able to um, collect the LiDAR. We could put it into Ugrid. We could share it to different members of the team very easily, even if they were at different organizations. And, um, and they can easily, even without a lot of technical expertise, because normally if you're using a point cloud, you have to have a special software, and you have to have some expertise. So without any special software expertise, you can come in here and uh, do measurements or pick uh, assets. So something else that we're looking into is asset collection. So we have this LiDAR data, and as you can see, it's almost as good as a photo in some cases. And we have thousands of assets along the right away that we really don't know where they are. So, light pictures, signs, and things like that, uh, signals. Um, with this sort of interface, someone can go through and easily extract those out of the, the LiDAR point cloud, which is georeferenced, <coughs> and um, without any technical knowledge. So, say you have someone from the signage department or an electrician, something like that. They can go through and pick out assets and create a, uh, a report or a database with all of the assets. So now instead of sending someone out in the field to report all of this, uh,
by the person collecting the LIDAR in the office, so uh, afterward. So this is one, uh, this is the first project that we used uh, U-Grid on and uh, with the terrestrial LIDAR, and we were looking at the tunnel before. But just on this project, we were able to share the LIDAR data and the other design data through U-Grid with um, the contractors doing the bidding. So they got a much better view of the project without having to go visit the project site, which can allow them to submit better bids and we don't have as much uncertainty. And um, we can easily share that data because we're not having to try to give them a CD or a hard drive or something. It's all web-based. You can share it with whoever you want. We even put instructions in the bid documents on how to access the data uh, from the grid. And so there's a link right in the bid documents that they can go to. And so throughout the project, um, we had a significant number of visits for people using the data on UGRID, from the contractor to the designer to um, CTK. And this has a potential to save a vast amount of time. Because if you look at, you know, before having an online portal, if someone had to go out and get some data from each of these things that they wanted to look up. Now you have to get on the track and then run service and you um, and it takes a lot of time just to get there. So so we can save a significant amount of time. Um, and on a more recent project we have collected LIDAR and even as a designer, so I also design some of our projects. Um, the video can save a significant amount of time showing with the, uh, the video portal before. So the quality of the video is high enough that you can actually view the detail of something that they need to design just from the video. So rather than having to go out each time I need to get additional information, I can run through this video and I can count signs or I can count, um, say, rail lines or anything that look for columns that are in the way, and it's a lot easier to go through than um, trying to look off of a drawing and see if you're going to have a conflict or uh, trying to get something. And a lot of our, because of the age of our system, a lot of the drawings are a little unreliable and missing um, for some of our older pieces of the network. So having the video is an invaluable tool, and it really, when you have a tech project that might it makes it
it depends on the scanner we're using. So we've had um, two different scanners and probably we probably target around 20 miles an hour, 20 to 35. But there is a balance. So the, the faster the scanner, obviously, the faster it can go, and that disrupts service less. So it, it is um, useful to have a higher speed scanner. But if you do go slower, then you just get more density. So I'd say we have had some data that's not been as dense as we would like, but um, but some of that's out of our control because we can we have to work within the service that's available. Well, to add that back, another thing I always compare is the traditional way as a surveyor, when we do cross sections on track or off all the way, typical interval 50 feet per section. Yeah. In the curved area, 25 feet per section. And now so we're getting at least 22 feet. That's right. Yeah. So if we can get that within two or three inches uh, cross sections, that's a lot of data to, yeah. to, to use. John, is this uh, being, is your grid being used for other transit systems? Uh, yes, we have a data from uh, Washington DC, Mulata. We have uh, data from uh, SEPTA in Philadelphia. And uh, actually mostly LiDAR data, but the other engineer joins plants as well. And uh, so there are a number of agencies that are, are using new grid uh, in the fourth third day. Thanks for sharing. It's very exciting, the project with all of us. It's really eye bright. Um, I can speak from my own experience of collecting data for a website that I developed on a home project with the support of UTC and Steve. It took two hours, um, about a year and a half actually, just to collect the raw data that related to environmental impact assessment of the real infrastructure. And we did run into a practical issue in the end, which is data sharing issue. I appreciate hearing new insights about how you handle it issue because a lot of data we gather are from our federal agencies or other secondary parties and um, some of them may not be comfortable with uh, having their data on our website and sharing with users. They may not fully understand the uh, consumption and so the reference or so the source of all the data. So in your case, it's wonderful. We all hope to have this all in one database. But if you get data request, uh, what would you suggest, or how did you really actually handle this integrated map when you have data not only from your um, uh, engineering um, process, but also from sector parties? Well, we can do it a couple of ways. Uh, uh, one is uh, we have an online tools to allow anybody to pay for new spaces uh, and uh, to process the data, create this uh, web URLs. And then, uh, pretty soon, we're going to release uh, uh, some of the automated features under the new CAM product so you can collect uh, many product web base, uh, product web pages and put into one portal. Again, those are all secured in the portal. So you have the access to the URL and uh, you have the username and password and you invite your colleagues, uh, friends, uh, or clients uh, to, to use the data. Uh, for those data, we may not have, or at least not yet, uh, the ultimate process. And most likely, either our map viewer or our panoramic viewer can handle that already. We'll be happy to help you to process that data and to publish that. So does that have anything related to copyright issues? Well, it's your data. Barrier? It's your data. It's up to you to select with whom you're sharing the data. Okay. And uh, so, I think to add to the question <coughs> is that the data could be residing, let's say you're getting data from the government. From the USGS. That, that data could be residing in your server. It doesn't have to be in your server, it doesn't have to be in your server. All we're doing is connecting a little pipe. To okay, the oh, I see what you mean, okay. Good to know, yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Okay. And each site is, you know, has a login, so, you know, you can invite someone to access the site specifically and they don't have access to that. They have a, a login to your grid and they've been invited to that specific site. So, so you rather collect the data or make the connection instead of hosting the data on the grid. Right. But that also help actually reduce the burden on the server. So, um, and I may be off on this, but um, do you expect the video data? Uh, is that meant as if someone has to watch the video to collect 
any information from the video or do you have any script that you have developed that will allow for data extraction from the video? Well, very good question. You're getting into the analytics part. So far, if you look at the uh, earlier slide, you know, we're focused on show, share, host, and find. Of course, with a more accumulation of the data, we will be definitely looking into analytics, uh, feature extractions, and to automate those processes. However, to my knowledge, with most of the algorithms uh, I have used uh, or I have seen, and uh, now them as 100%. So it depends on what you're looking for. If 70-80% uh, is successful rate, is it really not what you're doing? Sure, there are definitely algorithms available, and uh, you know, we would even mind to incorporate the, those routines into you to, to help with the process. But uh, for most of the engineering projects, especially for a client like mine, uh, we're looking for 100%, because if somebody's professional liability insurance is on the hook for that, therefore, a more many a way to go through the data to, to extract it, to collect it, uh, whatever the means and method is, so that's still uh, tip for the master. Yeah, because um, I know this is a big utility, uh, having the video at your disposal and you can watch the video, but it also is very time consuming. Uh, and so having watched enough videos, between Paul and me, we have watched too many videos <laughs> that we would like to share. I mean, so I was wondering if there's any mechanism that we can well, we, we don't have interest that we, we have to look into a field. Right now, we don't have any automated tool to, to publish that, but uh, as a separate service, probably that we, we, if there's a specific need, we mm -hmm. probably can look into it. How often, how often do you typically update the data for safe type of mining? Well, for all of the public layers that I demonstrate over there, and uh, in each of the dialog box, once you pop that up, on the lower right corner, there's a little eye. When you click that information, we have all of the metadata, where we get the data from, when was the updated, what's the UBIT plan to update that data is all up there. For instance, something like bridges, I believe uh, they update that once a year. So we'll try to keep up that frequency, update the data once a year. So. Is there any capability for live video? Uh, so, say there's a project that's being conducted in which uh, project manager, managers, it's, it's over a large area and they have a couple sporadic, not security, but just monitoring video. Um, do you have any capability at this point for having a live video stream within your within your data portal? Yes, okay. as long as uh, that camera is a somehow connected to the internet that enables the, the, the video stream. It would just be a link. Exactly. The, okay. we, we can handle that now. Uh, actually, there's a, a serving equipment company called the Care Company from this area, and uh, they have uh, they host, uh, I would say about uh, probably around 50 what they call the core stations. Those are continual occupied G GPS stations uh, to provide a surveyor and other people to, to use that. Uh, every night, uh, their data is uh, downloaded, let's say, uh, shoot to our server. That's uh, all automatic. Uh, we have interface with them. Uh, that we enable users to download that. The yeah. web portal is on their website, uh, and it's actually a you can map of with the downloading capability. Uh, to Matt, um, and, and sort of gets back to Shiraj's question about time consuming. You said there are time savings already involved here. And before you used Ugrid, what would your what was your alternative for handling data, pro big data, project data? Did you have in-house support that would help you or you know, kind of explain to us how you went from one method of doing things to this method? Yeah, so before it was just a manual process, right? Um, I think for us, Ugrid came with the LiDAR, so we didn't really have LiDAR data to speak up before we had Ugrid. But um, from dealing with just some of the record LiDAR data we have, it sits on a server you can load it into MicroStation or AutoCAD and, you know, it's it's not very usable because if it's on a server, if it's not if it's not uh, labeled very well or if it's not um, set up very well, then it limits the amount of people that can use it quickly, right? And otherwise, you know, before that, say in the subway, when a few years ago we had a, a subway track review project. We had a couple of guys out there like every day for weeks counting ties to get the different dimensions for the ties so that we could um, specify the job type. So now
now we could look at that on the video and maybe collect most of that information on the video and then just go check it. But, you know, you'd have someone in the field for weeks. And that really is expensive to have someone in the field for weeks. And we don't have a lot of people, so, you know, it's important to use everyone's time as effectively as possible. Yeah, and I think probably the Dan Ryan track reconstruction was one of the biggest track projects anyway we've done in a long time. So, um, so that was a very involved project, and I think even with this tool, it was still hugely labor intensive, and I think without it, it would have been, we wouldn't have had the quality of project that we did. So, that was that was a project that you had to do in three months. Yeah, we had 18 miles of track in five months. And then the design effort was only like a year. So when we had basically a full depth reconstruction all the way to the dirt. So we had to develop um, new track geometry, which similarly matched the what was existing, but you know, new track geometry, new cross sections, new elevations, everything to the whole eighteen miles. And they were able to do that pretty quickly because they had um, you know, the LIDAR and other data that was available. So. I just want to add that. Once they come down to the poor surveyor, like myself, I haven't had two months to get a cruise <laughs> out there to yeah. LIDAR for, you know, the whole section. <laughs> yeah, and it allowed us, so on that one in particular, we had some clearance issues and using the uh, um, LIDAR data and the other data available allowed us to really optimize the track through those tight clearance areas, and so when we got out there to do the test train, it was really pretty nice. We didn't have to do anything. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of, of during construction issues of that because it was kind of settled along the way. So, so that in itself can save a lot of aggregation. Have you um, gotten into like, working with, like, uh, I guess you would call it FRA regulated infrastructure? Um, with this, or is it primarily been transit so far? What, CN? Yeah, well, we, uh, uh, there's a federal mandate of a PTC, positive train control. Uh, we have a pilot you know, uh, with a CN railroad and uh, using uh, mobile LiDAR and using exactly what you saw and uh, to click out the, the features required by uh, PTC and uh, to populate their, their database. I think also on the public layers, I think you also have rail crossings. Right? Yes, we do. Yes. Yeah, railroads have been using LIDAR systems for a little while. And they've gotten much better, but, uh, but when you have 100 miles of LIDAR, it can be hard to do something with it. <laughs> I think that's exactly what kind of see if they're yeah. 100 miles. Yeah. Let's, let's try this. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, sorry. What sort of like LiDAR filtering capabilities, like so for when we've used LiDAR, one of the big issues we run into is we want to get a good uh, topographic map of just ground, like filtering out all the vegetation and everything. Um, can you could do that or help with that? Or? Uh, I would consider, as I answered the previous question, as part of the analytics or yeah. processing. Not yet. Right now it's more focused on hosting, visualization, and so forth and so on. And uh, we have been talking to a number of uh, software vendors, for instance. Uh, I know somebody who is specialized in just to get all of the vegetation out yeah. through a LiDAR process. So um, we, we have a separate uh, two category we call U2, meaning the tooling to process data. And uh, so we've been working you know, with uh, some vendors to hopefully bring them on board. Uh, because one of our focus is uh, uh, web based. Uh, the way we've been hosting LiDAR data, whether you know, for CTA or for uh, OMAD or for a set that is, uh, uh, you can download the LAS or FDZ file, depending on whatever they, whoever collects the data offers. Uh, and then with the data download, you know, then that enables the user using whatever they choose to do process. And so right now it's not available online for you, with it, but that is definitely an area yeah. we're interested in that. So the workflow that we've had up to now is we go out and we collect all the LiDAR data and we get this huge amount of raw data, right? But due to uh, the challenges of Chicago, that all has to be um, straightened out because the GPS signal isn't quite right or whatever. So they'll actually go out and they'll survey 
or put out targets ahead of time that shows up in the LiDAR data. So once that's all straightened out, processed, and everything, then it gets posted on the grid. And, um, and then, then you have the thing where the technical people can download it do more stuff with it, and then the non-technical people can just use what's provided. I think uh, we're almost up in time. I see our moderators getting up to close the session. But I think it's important to tell everyone how they can use or test UGRID themselves. How can how can they access UGRID to use it? And you and you might provide some credits. Oh sure. Uh, you know, by telling www.ugrid.com, everybody can get on there. It's a free sign up. If uh, anybody wants to use our tools uh, and uh, test it, I'll be happy to provide. Uh, no, we call it a coupon, but then you can out the, from the online store to purchase that basically the free credit to test out you know, your, your first project or something or first map. Yeah. Um, we are up against the hour, so I would like to thank John and Matt uh, for taking time uh, and busy day to come and talk to us and explain the user platform to the rest of us. And Looks like a very interesting technology, obviously. There's more possibilities out there, and I'm sure you guys are thinking about those also. And uh, if anyone's curious to test it, please go ahead and test it and give us some feedback. And then I'm sure your contact information is on the. Actually, uh, we have our brochures out there. We have uh, well, I'll be happy to leave some business cards here. Yeah. So uh, you guys can get in touch with Tom uh, and provide any feedback that you may have about your experience for the content. And I would like to thank all of you for being here. And for those of you online, thank you for staying on. And we'll see you soon with another seminar in the near future. Thank you all. Thank you.